Good morning. I invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Luke, Gospel of Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, and we'll be looking and focusing our attention on one particular story here in the story of the life of Jesus in Luke chapter 17. I hope everyone had a, a good holiday. It's been already been mentioned multiple times this morning. And I hope that you were able to spend some time, uh, one of the last several days or multiple of those days, with friends, with family, sharing uh, food probably, and uh, memories, stories, uh, good times, and maybe even germs. Uh, Asher came home from my in-laws with a cold, and I'm sure he's not the only one. It's that time of year, uh, not only in the weather, but in all the time that we're spending with each other. But it's a good thing to have that opportunity. And I was struck on Wednesday when we were gathered here for our singing and prayer service Wednesday night. Multiple people in that service that led a prayer prayed uh, acknowledging that the Thanksgiving holiday is, is not just the only time in the year that we give thanks, that it should be an ongoing thing every day of our lives. And Nathan, earlier this morning, prayed that the Thanksgiving spirit, so to speak, would continue in us, that we would carry it on uh, from this weekend going forward. And it strikes me that the fact that we say that, by the way, that's a very commendable thing to pray. It's very appropriate that we would pray that prayer. But the fact that we do, the fact that we acknowledge that and that we pray that, I think indicates that not necessarily the easiest thing to carry on that spirit of gratitude. It's, it's actually kind of hard to live that thanksgiving, that thankfulness, every day, every week of our lives. And so we might ask why. What is it that makes thanksgiving, what is it that makes thankfulness challenging? Or you could ask, what are the obstacles that stand in the way from us, or between us and thankfulness? And that's the question I want to spend some time reflecting on this morning. What is the obstacle? What are the obstacles to thankfulness? We won't talk about all of them, but I want to talk about one in particular that is maybe a little bit surprising. And uh, this story here in Luke chapter 17, I think, helps to highlight this unexpected obstacle to thanksgiving. Uh, I think a familiar story to us here in Luke 17, starting in verse 11. But uh, if you're like me, I was reading uh, Asher's Bible stories with him the other night, and this story came up, and I was like, oh yeah, I kind of forgot this story was in the Bible. So uh, it's good to reflect on it. Luke chapter 17, notice this story here in verse 11. It says, while Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him and raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face uh, at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found to give glory, to return to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. Two or three, two or three things that we want to point out uh, this morning from this story. But before we do that, I want to understand a little bit about the nature of thankfulness and what that means to be thankful, at least according to this story here. You may have noticed that there are actually several ways that the text of this passage describes what the Samaritan did, what the Samaritan leper did. After he is healed, in verse 15, it says that he turned back and was, quote, glorifying God with a loud voice. But then when he gets to Jesus in verse 16, it says he falls down before him and gives thanks to him. But then again in verse 18, Jesus remarks on what the man did and said that he gave glory to God. And then finally, uh, at the end of the story, Jesus tells the man that 
your faith has made you well. So I think what we see in the story is that to give thanks is the same as giving glory to God. Giving thanks is the same as giving glory to God. And all of that is a demonstration of faith or of trust. Giving glory essentially just means giving credit, right? Giving praise, honoring uh, the person to whom honor is due. Recognizing that uh, you know, they are the one that deserves that. And that's really what thankfulness is. To be thankful is to acknowledge where a gift comes from. To acknowledge, it wasn't me. I didn't do this for myself. Someone did this for me. Someone gave this gift to me. And so, for that reason, genuine thankfulness comes from a heart of humility. Because I deeply accept that it's not me. And someone else deserves the credit. Someone else gets the glory. And of course, in this, take, uh, this case, we're talking about thankfulness before God. Giving Him the glory. Acknowledging that whatever gift I have received, that is, every gift that I have received, comes from Him. He alone deserves the credit, deserves the glory. And again, all of that is a manifestation or a demonstration of faith. Faith is trusting in God who provides for us. And so when he provides for us, we don't take any of the credit ourselves. We give him the glory because we trust in him. He's the one who provides. He's the one on whom we rely. He's the one on whom we depend for everything. So we depend on him. We rely on him. We trust in him. And if we truly trust in him, when he provides, we're the first ones to say it. It was God who did it. It wasn't me. So all of that, I think, is overlapping in this story. Thankfulness, giving glory to God, trusting in God. But a few things we want to point out about thankfulness from this story. And the first is to our question of the surprising obstacle. As it turns out, I think this story highlights for us that abundance, abundance is a very real obstacle to thanksgiving. Abundance is a real obstacle to thankfulness. Notice just the math in this story, right? Ten lepers, all ten of them, 100%, were suffering from a horrible affliction. You're probably familiar with leprosy in the Bible. Uh, maybe you've even uh, seen it firsthand or heard about uh, leprosy that still afflicts people today in our modern world primarily in other countries. But leprosy is a, not only a, a painful disease that you know, takes away the, the appendages of your body that start to, to waste away, to deteriorate, uh, these sores, you become deformed. Uh, uh, likely, leprosy will be the reason you die. It's a fatal disease in many cases. But especially in this context, in the world that Jesus was living in, leprosy was not just a physical affliction that was very painful and led to death, but it was uh, basically the end of a person's social life. Right? They, because of their leprosy, had to live isolated from everybody else. In the law of Moses, prescribed in the law, in Leviticus chapter 13, it describes how a leper is unclean. It has to separate themselves from other people. They have to walk around covering their mouth, saying, unclean, unclean, so that other people would not come near them. And so these ten lepers, all ten of them, are suffering from a horrible affliction. And all ten of them cry out to Jesus and ask for help. They recognize the authority that Jesus has. They call him master. They ask for mercy. That's the exact thing that they should be doing. They know that Jesus is the one that can heal them. So they cry out for mercy. And all ten of them, we should acknowledge, act in faith. This is one of those miracles, and Jesus did this quite commonly, where he would tell the person to do something, and then upon their obedience, the cleansing or the healing would result. He doesn't cleanse them right there when they're, you know, with him. He says, go show yourselves to the priest. And so they have to act in faith. They have to act obediently to the one that they just called master. But all 10 of them do it. They turn and go. And as they are going, all 10 of them are healed of their affliction. But if 10 people will cry out to Jesus in their affliction, only one. 
only one will stop after they have been healed. Once the affliction is gone, once the pain has been taken away, go back to Jesus and say, thank you. I think there's something very uh, uh, poignant in that and something that I think, if we're honest, we see in our lives as well. This has actually been mentioned a few times recently, and I'm, I'm glad about that. We should continue to say it. That, you know, we have our prayer services, and we ask for prayers of people that need help, and the list is almost literally endless. We could go on and on. We pray for so many people, so many afflictions, and we should be doing that. I'm so glad that we have the opportunities to do that. But several people have mentioned recently, well, what about when those prayers are answered? Are we saying thank you? Is our list of thanksgiving to God just as long as the list of people and situations that we're praying for, uh, where we're asking for something, asking for help from God? In some ways, it's, it's harder. There's an obstacle there. When we have abundance, when we are blessed, and I will say I think that's true in our personal lives as well. Yes, of course, many of us, here in this room, are suffering from a very difficult situation. But generally speaking, we just have an embarrassment of riches. Literally of material wealth and of money. We are the richest people ever to have lived on the earth. But the comfort we enjoy, uh, friends and family, the health that we have, generally speaking, we just have so much. How often do we stop to say thank you? to God, to give glory to him for what he has given us. Now, the Bible says that actually having an abundance of riches is a spiritual danger. It's an obstacle to thankfulness. Having an abundance of riches is a spiritual danger. Uh, in Proverbs 30, there's this very interesting uh, uh, statement where it's actually agar, the words of agar, uh, not Solomon in Proverbs 30. Verse 8 and 9, where he says, I'll paraphrase here, God, I don't want riches, and I don't want poverty. Because he says, in riches, I will be tempted to deny the Lord and say, who is he? While in poverty, I'll be tempted to steal and do harm to my fellow man. That's, there's wisdom right there. Praying not to have riches so that we will not forget the Lord, deny him, and fail to give him glory. In fact, if you want to turn to this passage, or at least mark it or write it down to look at later, uh, incredibly, I think, insightful and powerful in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. In the book of Deuteronomy, the, the children of Israel are finishing up their time in the wilderness, a very difficult time, a time of affliction. And they are about to enter into the promised land, the land famously flowing with milk and honey. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 8, Moses is preparing the people to enter into this beautiful land of milk and and honey, where God is going to provide for them so much. And just let's read a little bit here in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 6. Uh, a longer reading, but notice, uh, if you see it in your Bible or you're listening, what this says about the spiritual danger of abundance. Moses tells the children of Israel, Deuteronomy 8 verse 6, Therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to fear him, for the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, fountains and springs, flowing forth in valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land where you will eat food without scarcity, in which you will not lack anything, a land whose stones are iron, out of whose hills you can dig copper, when you have eaten, verse 10, and are satisfied, you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Verse 11, beware, beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes, which I am commanding you today. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied and have built good houses and lived in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and gold multiply and all that you have multiplies, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. 
He led you through the great and terrible wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water. He brought water for you out from the, flint, uh, the rock of flint. In the wilderness, he fed you manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you and do good for you in the end. Verse 17, otherwise you may say in your heart, my power and the strength of my hand made me this wealth. But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who is giving you power to make wealth, that he may confirm his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. When we're in the wilderness, as hard as it is, it is oftentimes easier to see the way that God is providing Whatever that is, whether that's a, 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 an emotional crisis or a sickness that we're facing or even a financial crisis, and we're scraping by, right? Week to week, day to day, month to month, and we see it. Man, God, God really came through for me. If it hadn't been for him, there's no way I would have made it through this last week or month or year. You can see that easily when we go through difficulty, and we're thankful because it's very, very obvious to us in those moments that without him, we would have no hope. But abundant times when the milk and honey are flowing, we have wheat stored up in the barns and the savings accounts are full and the income's good and life is happy and nobody's sick and we're just smooth sailing, right? Then I think what happens is what Moses describes here in Deuteronomy chapter 8. We start to forget. We start to forget. We forget the difficult times, perhaps. We forget what God has done for us in the past. And we start to look around at our life and the, the wealth that we have, the comfort we enjoy, and say, man, I've done pretty good for myself. I've really worked hard for all this. I, I, should, I should be proud of what I've done and, and what I have and what I've built up in my life. But God told the children of Israel what he would tell us as well. God is the one who's even given us life in the first place, much less the strength and the opportunity and the ability to provide whatever it is that we have. It's not ours. God has given it to us, and he's blessed us with the ability to obtain it. But abundance can be a very real spiritual danger and obstacle to thankfulness. And so Paul said... In a famous passage of Philippians 4, remember he says, I've learned the secret. And we always focus on one kind of half of this here, where he says, I've learned the secret of how to get by in humble means. But that's not actually all that Paul says. He says in Philippians 4, I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity, Paul says. In every circumstance, I've learned the secret. The secret of being filled. Isn't that odd? There's a secret to being filled and to being hungry. Both of having abundance and suffering need. So what's the secret to living in abundance, Paul? Well, it's the same as the secret to living in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The secret is not forgetting where these things come from in the first place. All things come from God. All things that we do is because of the Lord. It gives us the ability to do it. As Job said in his affliction, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's not forget that when God is giving to us in abundance. So the first thing from this story in Luke 17, abundance can be a very real obstacle to thankfulness. The second thing we want to point out is that insiders, insiders are generally less grateful than outsiders. Insiders have a tendency to be less grateful than outsiders. That's the other dynamic here in this story in Luke 17. Not only is it the math problem, 10 go to Jesus uh, to ask for help, only one goes back to say thanks. But the other dynamic here is that the one who goes back to say thanks is a Samaritan. Samaritans were uh, kind of a half-breed. They were a race of people, a group of people that kind of came to be after the captivity, after a bunch of the people from the northern kingdom of Israel were taken away into Assyria, other people were put in the land, non-Jewish people, 
And those people, you know, uh, intermarried and this kind of new group of people popped up. And so they were, they were not only half-breeds in terms of their ethnicity, we might say, but even their religion was kind of a weird mix of Judaism with some other stuff mixed in. And so the Jews looked at them with a lot of contempt, a lot of disgust. The Samaritans, right? They didn't have anything to do with them. This is the third time in the book of Luke that Samaritans have been mentioned. In Luke chapter 9, uh, there's a Samaritan village that Jesus wants to enter into. And they reject Jesus and they say, no, we don't want Jesus to come in here. And so James and John, the Jewish disciples of Jesus, say to him, Jesus, this is our opportunity. Let's call down fire on these guys. Burn up the whole city because they won't accept you. And Jesus says, no, 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 that's not the way we do things. But you can see in that some of their attitude. I don't think they were calling down fire on all the Jewish cities that were rejecting Jesus, right? And then in the next chapter in Luke 10, there's the very familiar parable that Jesus tells. When a, a Jew comes to Jesus and asks about, you know, who's my neighbor? Who should I love? Jesus tells the story of three people that walked by someone in great need. Someone who had been robbed and beaten. And the priest and the Levite, the ultimate insiders, pass by on the other side. Do not stop to help the man. While the third man, the Samaritan, stops to care for him and show him mercy. And in these two stories, I think you see something that's reflected in this third story with the ten lepers, one of whom is a Samaritan. There's this characterization of the Jewish people who have the covenant. They are God's chosen people, and they're maybe proud of that, and they feel a little bit entitled. Now, this, is, this is who we are. This is our birthright. And so they're puffed up about that a little bit, and so when it comes to helping others when it comes to extending mercy to others they are not so willing to do that we're the jewish people we're god's elect and it could be that in the story of the 10 lepers by the way we're kind of assuming that the other nine are jewish i think that's a pretty safe assumption but it could be that they're that factors in here that they maybe feel like well you know god owed this to us right i mean we're we're God's special people. The fact that we had leprosy in the first place was very unjust on God's part. But now, you know, it's about time. You know, I, God owes this to us. We deserve to be cleansed, to be healed, to live normal lives like everybody else. We're speculating a little bit here. But I think the Samaritan's status as, as an outsider makes it easier for him to be grateful. It makes it easier for him to... Turn around and give glory to God. I think this is something that we also have to be on guard for. This principle that insiders tend to be less grateful than outsiders. You know, I think we're familiar with the, uh, the it's a story that is just repeated over and over again in history. You have the first guy uh, who builds a business, starts from scratch, right? Never, get, you know, never, he frames that first dollar bill that he makes in his business. He never forgets where he comes from. He builds this business. He's frugal. He's generous with what he has. Always appreciates it. But then his son grows up in the midst of all that wealth, enjoys it, doesn't know anything different. And when he comes to be an adult, he's spoiled, entitled, wasteful, doesn't appreciate what he's been given, has no concept of anything different. And I wonder how much of that happens for us in a spiritual sense. In fact, there's stories uh, of many people in this room, several people in this room. All of this right here that we're enjoying this morning, okay, they didn't have it growing up. They didn't grow up in a Christian home. They grew up in brokenness, in the world, seeing sin at its worst. And yet they were as adults, introduced to the love of Jesus, the forgiveness that comes through the blood of Jesus, to the reality of a family of believers from all over the world that can share their lives together. And I know for a fact that those of you that that's your story, that you didn't have it growing up, but now you do, you don't take it for granted. And you take every opportunity you can to enjoy it, to appreciate it. But then there's another group of us, like myself. This is all we've ever known. 
We're raised in the pews, so to speak. And I know for me, it's harder to appreciate it. And sometimes we come to feel like we ourselves, maybe like the Jews in the Gospel of Luke. Yeah. We're entitled. This is our birthright. This is, this is who we are, right? And we don't appreciate it as much as we should. And maybe even are tempted to become like the Pharisee in a story that Jesus tells in the very next chapter, in Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, you'll remember this parable, but I want to read it. Luke 18 and verse 9, Jesus told a parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. He said, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, Jesus says, standing some distance away, was unwilling even to lift up his eyes to heaven, he was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. When we're so used to this, we've grown up around it, it's all we've ever known. It's easy to become like this Pharisee and say, man, I'm so glad I'm not like those people out there. It's ironic. He says, I'm thankful. Man, the thankful Pharisee, right? I thank you, God. But he's not really thankful because we know what thankfulness is. Thankfulness is glory to God, no credit for yourself, appreciating what's been given because you know it's not of you. He says, I'm thankful. But the whole thing he says is that I am not this and that I fast twice a week and I obey the commandments. It's all about him. And if we're not careful, those of us who are insiders in that sense can fall prey to that same sort of attitude. And as a result, think the Good Samaritan or James and John calling down fire. We're so wrapped up in our pride of who we are as Christians that we neglect people on the side of the road who are in need of the gospel. That we are quick to be judgmental and harsh for people. I can't believe these people that won't accept the gospel or who live in sin. But I think all of that is traced back to a lack of gratitude, a lack of appreciation for the beautiful gift that God has given us in Jesus. So if, point one, abundance is a very real obstacle to thankfulness. I think being an insider is also another obstacle because insiders, again, generally tend to be less grateful than outsiders. But here's where we want to end. Here's the point we want to conclude with this morning. We are all the outsiders. We're all outsiders. We're looking at a story about lepers. We're all lepers. <laughs> We are all corrupted by our sin. Like the leper whose body is falling apart, deteriorating in front of their eyes, our lives are deteriorating, falling apart because of our sin, because of our rebellion against God. Not to mention the lives of other people that we have hurt, ruined because of our sin. If we don't appreciate that fully, if we don't see that in our lives we are those lepers, then I think it's the case that we don't understand the nature of sin as well as we should. This passage here, or one verse here in Titus chapter 3, I think Paul is making this exact same point uh, to Titus. When he tells uh, Titus to tell the Christians in Titus 3, to not speak evil of anybody in verse 2. To avoid quarreling, to be gentle, to show perfect courtesy towards all people. Why? Titus 3 verse 3, listen to this. We ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others, and hating one another. 
Paul says, we, all of us, not just those of us that grew up outside the church. We all grew up outside the church. We all grew up and chose to rebel against God, to forsake Him, to sin against Him, to hate Him, and to follow after our own pleasures and our own lusts. And so we're all lepers. And we're all Samaritans. It's interesting, Jesus uh, says in this story, no one came back except this foreigner. That word he uses for foreigner there is actually the exact same word. There was a sign in the temple complex. After the court of the Gentiles, to go any further, there was a sign that said, you know, I don't know exactly, no foreigners past this point here. Samaritans were cut off from the assembly of God's people from entering the presence of God. And our sin has done the exact same thing to us. We have all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Our sin has separated us from God. And we deserve nothing. We deserve nothing. God owes us nothing except really death and destruction and the misery that we have brought upon ourselves. We are all the lepers. We are all the outcasts. We are all the Samaritans. We are all outsiders. In fact, look at the story right before the story of the ten lepers in Luke chapter 17. This is what Jesus says. He says, Will any of you who has a slave plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, Come at once, slave. Recline at my table. Verse 8, will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me, dress properly, serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. I think we sometimes think that God should thank me for all the work that I'm doing and have me sit down and treat me like a king. But if you understand, if we understand our state as sinful people, deserving nothing but death and misery, we understand that we are just the unworthy, even if, and how many of us do all that we are commanded to do, all that we ought to do. He says, even if you've done all that you've done or supposed to do, he says, I'm nothing but an unworthy slave. God does not owe us anything. And we do not, get the, we do not deserve the thanks of God for how special we are. Instead, we give Him thanks. We give Him glory. We lean and depend on Him. And we owe him everything. And that really, as we close this morning, is the essence of thankfulness. Thankfulness is giving credit to where credit is due. So let's make it a point. This week, for starters, right? We got all year. Let's just start this week. Let's start today. Carrying on the spirit of thanksgiving. Let's start today. Stop at some point. Turn the TV off. Put the phone down. Go into your room and say thank you to God for what it is that he's given us. Whatever it is we have, he's given it to us. But let's also be like the Samaritan. He didn't quietly come back to Jesus and privately say, hey, Jesus, I really appreciate what you did for me here. You know, He was loudly proclaiming it, telling anyone who would listen, loudly glorifying God. Let's say thank you to God. Stop in the midst of our busy lives and say thank you let's praise him and glorify him loudly tell other people maybe it's weird to tell people things like yeah thanks to god or all glory to god or god willing but that's exactly the words that should be on our lips but true thankfulness then gives everything to him it is a response of of the whole heart of the whole life not to try to repay God in some transactional way, feeling like, well, if I can check all the boxes, then I really do deserve it after all. But a life of thankfulness is one that says, I, 
can never repay, and so I will give everything I have to the one who has saved me from my sins, cured me of my leprosy, given me access to the presence of God, given me life and life abundantly now and forever. And that response of thanksgiving begins with humbling oneself before the Lord, being immersed in water, to come into contact with the blood of Jesus, to have your sins washed away, to begin a life living in purity and living in thankfulness to God. So if you need to do that this morning, we'd ask you to wait no longer and come to the front as we stand and sing this song. What?